Who would have ever thought the Houthis would become a power in world politics? Who would have ever thought the IC, the South Africans would go to bat for a poor, powerless, stateless people in Gaza? In this godforsaken place, this godforsaken concentration camp called Gaza. Anyone looking for a silver bullet that's going to, you know, solve it? No, that's not how politics works. It's a confluence of forces which gradually reach at some point, to use the cliche, critical mass. Welcome to the Big Picture Podcast. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we speak with writer and historian Norman Finkelstein. Professor Finkelstein has documented the Israel-Palestine conflict for more than four decades, with a particular focus on Israel's actions in Gaza. As the son of Holocaust survivors, he became particularly critical of Israel's use of history as a propaganda tool to shut down critique, something he documents in his book, The Holocaust Industry. Since October 7, he's been one of the most prolific voices speaking out, accusing Israel of committing genocide and calling Gaza a concentration camp. In this expansive interview, I speak to him about the value of international law, this historic turning point in Palestinian advocacy, and his view on Israel's moral argument for its own existence. Dr. Norman Finkelstein, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to The Big Picture. Thank you for having me on. You mentioned, uh, as we were talking just before, uh, that you have published one of the seminal works about the political history of Gaza. And we are now in the throes of, you know, public diplomatic negotiations uh, between the United States and and the Palestinian factions, uh, whether it's Hamas or the PA um, and Israel, uh, over what kind of political solution could arise that could end the hostilities that we're seeing on the ground in Gaza and that we have been seeing over the last eight months. And of course, there's a great deal of skepticism about what uh, kind of solution could arise and in whose favor? Uh, is it a solution that determines that Hamas is no longer uh, in the picture, that they lay down their arms and dismantle themselves? Is that even a realistic possibility that something that they will agree to? Um, is there a, a solution that will restore any sort of uh, sovereignty for the Palestinian people in Gaza? Um, there's also a lot of skepticism about that. But from your perspective, as somebody that has studied the political nature of Hamas, of, of Gaza and of Israel's relationship with it, what is the moment that we're in right now? And, and from your perspective, what do Hamas and Israel want and, and what are they actively trying to achieve? Well, there are many questions intertwined in that question. I'm going to focus on two. Hmm. Number one, I don't believe there is in the foreseeable future now or in the foreseeable future any solution to the situation in Gaza. And I think it's utterly pointless to uh, squander time discussing that question uh, or allowing it as a distraction from what needs to be focused on now. Now, why am I so pessimistic? I will, or why am I pessimistic? Uh, I'll give you my reasons. Uh, if you look at past history of the, the past history of negotiations between Israel and uh, the Palestinians, with the U.S. obviously being the interlocutor. Uh, if you look at the history of negotiations, um, it was mostly a question of what you might call percentages. What do I mean by percentages? So let's look at Camp David in 2000, the negotiations between Ehud Barak, uh, Yasser Arafat, with Clinton, President Clinton presiding, or look at Annapolis, the negotiations in 2007, 2008. If you look at, uh, yes, 2007, 2008. If you look at those negotiations, basically there are five, there are four major issues in the Israel-Palestine conflict. There's borders, settlements, refugees, borders, settlements, refugees, and Jerusalem. Those have mm -hmm. been considered the four critical issues. So without going into what the law has to say in this subject, I want to just look at what the negotiations have to say about the subject. 
So if you look, let's start with settlement. Well, let's start with borders. The question was under the under the law, and I said I won't go into the law, but under the law, uh, how uh, West Bank, Gaza, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, are called occupied Palestinian territories. That was affirmed by the International Court of Justice in the, in a advisory opinion in July two thousand four. So those are occupied Palestinian territories. As a practical matter, the question became, how much territory could Israel annex from the West Bank in pursuit of a final settlement? So Israel wanted to annex roughly, I'm not going to go into all the details, roughly about 10% of the West Bank. They gave some forms of what were called land swaps uh elsewhere in israel uh in exchange for a partial exchange for the uh, for the 10 percent it wanted to annex so there you could say is uh, the palestinians were willing to let israel annex roughly two percent so it was 10 percent versus two percent on the question of settlements israel wanted to retain in place about 80 percent of the settlers the palestinians in what were called settlement blocks uh in the annapolis negotiations omert who was the prime minister at the time he wanted to retain 87 percent of the settlers the palestinian position was 60 percent you can keep in the in you can keep in place 60 percent of the settlers but they can't be in these blocks settlement blocks because they would then um uh undermine the territorial contiguity of a palestinian state mm -hmm. without going into any more details my point is it was a question of percentages that they were arguing about finally they couldn't reach a settlement oh there's also a question the percentage of re refugees who could return yeah. um so it was all about uh, uh um percentages at this point there's no basis whatsoever for any agreement between the two sides israel is not willing to relinquish one square dunam of land in the occupied palestinian territories so we're so far away from where the negotiations stood in the 2000s. And even there, the gap was proved to be unbridgeable. So now you have this government which won't accept the state anywhere, not even a telephone booth with a flag called Palestine affixed aloft on it. So there's no basis right now to talk about the settlement. It's a complete, in my opinion, waste of time. And that brings us up to brings us to the second aspect of the question you um, asked. What does each side want? And there too, I think there's simply no grounds for any optimism, and the grounds are only the only grounds of pessimism. Israel has set two goals since October 7. Goal number one is to inflict a devastating military defeat on Hamas to restore what it calls its deterrence capability. Namely, it seemed surprisingly, shockingly weak in terms of its military and technical and intelligence prowess on October 7th. And so it has to restore the Arab world's fear of it, what it calls its deterrence capability, because the, uh, the message transmitted by October 7th was, hey, maybe Israel isn't as invincible as we thought it was and maybe there is a military option 
against Israel. And Israel is now determined to dislodge that idea from anyone in the Arab world. And so the first step has to be to destroy Hamas. But that's only what you might call the tip of the iceberg. The bigger goal of Israel is it wants to, as it says, make sure there is no recurrence of October 7th ever. And there is only one way to do that, and that is to make Gaza, as many Israeli senior officials have said, to make Gaza unlivable and uninhabitable, which is what has been its major goal the last seven months. In my opinion, and we can always disagree or agree to disagree, the actual attempt to defeat Hamas militarily has been, in my opinion, incidental in the last seven months. For the simple reason that Israel hasn't a clue where Hamas is lodged, where Hamas is hiding, they have no idea. Now, if you look at former Israeli, uh, what it calls operations in Gaza, what you basically high tech murder sprees, if you look at Operation Cast Lead in 2008 9, if you look at Operation Protective Edge in 2014, one of the notable things about the soldier testimonies the Israeli soldier testimonies, is one after another, they said, and they're voluminous at this point, they never saw a Hamas fighter. They never saw a Hamas fighter. There were no battles being fought during those uh, Israeli murder sprees, high-tech murder sprees, for a very simple reason. The density and intensity of the bombing were such that Hamas couldn't fight them. They were just being inundated with bombs and artillery shells. So they couldn't actually come out from hiding to fight. And the Israelis would never go into any area where there was even a hint of a possibility of a Hamas fighter. They didn't want to die. It was the same thing in Lebanon in 2006. They don't want to die. So the whole area ahead of the soldiers has to be utterly decimated and pulverized before any soldier goes in. If you look at the current situation, you follow it as well as anybody. Have you heard any reports of major battles? No. None, because I don't think they, there are any battles. Yes, many Hamas fighters have died, but they have died in the same way as civilians have died. They've died in the course of the indiscriminate bombing and indiscriminate, indiscriminate artillery shelling of um, Gaza. But actual battles, no. So yes, Hamas has been, uh, has been, its fighting capabilities have been diminished, but they have been diminished in commensurate with the total destruction of Gaza. It's not as if there has been a specific military component that's been disabled or dis diminished. It's the indiscriminate destruction of everything in Gaza, which brings me back to my point that um, I don't believe the last seven months has been in any meaningful sense an Israel-Hamas war because they don't know where Hamas is. They haven't a clue. It's seven months. They still don't know where any of the leaders are they still don't know where any of the hostages are. So um, I am uh, skeptical on the Israeli side 
of any possibility of an agreement because of those two goals. There's the goal to disarm, defeat Hamas, which is a goal, but it can't be effectively achieved because they don't know where Hamas is. Mm -hmm. And there's the bigger goal of making Gaza unlivable and uninhabitable. That is their current goal. They're only going into Rafah, not because there are four Hamas battalions here. They haven't a clue what's in Rafah, not because of the tunnels, they're pr presumably tunnels, uh, but they don't know where they are. They're doing it because they want to complete the job. Three quarters of Gaza now, three quarters is uninhabitable. There's one quarter that remains habitable, the Gaza governorate. That's, excuse me, the Rafa government. That's it. So completing the job is not completing the defeat of Hamas. It's completing the job of making Gaza unlivable and uninhabitable to reduce the whole of the Gaza to rubble, dust and rubble. Uh, which brings me to another point. One of the amusing things about this Biden Netanyahu, so called uh, Biden, so called Netanyahu peace plan, is they talk about five years of international rehabilitation. <clears throat> what could that possibly mean? After Operation Protective Edge in 2014, which was spectacularly destructive the head of the ice of the icrc the international committee of the red cross peter morer he said after touring gaza in the aftermath of the war uh, israeli um, uh, high-tech murder spree he said and remember this is coming from the head of the icrc he said i have never in my life seen the level of destruction I saw in Gaza. If you'll just allow me uh, one second, I'll just give you the exact quote uh, because it is, in my opinion, quite revealing. That's all right. Take your time. I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. Okay? Now, it was estimated after Operation Protective Edge, there were 2.5 no, million tons of rubble in Gaza. As of last month, do you know what the estimate is? 38 million tons of rubble. It's estimated by experts, it would take 10 to 15 years just to clear away the rubble before you can begin any reconstruction. Remember, the rubble is filled with a lot of unexploded ordnance. It's going to be a very tough job. So when they throw in a figure five years of reconstruction, it's completely laughable. Then there's a second thing. Israel has a restriction on what it calls dual use items, namely items which can be used for military or for civilian purposes. So if an item is classified as dual use, and that includes everything, including scissors, really, uh, they don't admit it. So how are you going to admit concrete? They consider the main dual use item to be concrete, because concrete can be used in Israeli mines to make tunnels. So they have always prohibited the entry of concrete. How are you going to re rebuild Gaza if you prohibit the entry of cement? They don't allow cement into Gaza. I want to, uh, to um, look at two points that you made. Yeah, um, I, I want to just complete the thought. Sure, go ahead. On the Israeli side, there's no possibility of a settlement given its goals and given things like you can't reconstruct if you don't let cement into Gaza. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's the other aspect. They talk about a ceasefire, okay? A ceasefire. 
I can't even imagine what that possibly means. If you look at the Israel, the history of Israel, uh, in terms of its wars, they're very adept at provocations whenever they want a war. How did the 1956 war begin between Israel, you know, the Israel, the U.S. Excuse me, Israel, the U.K. Uh, and France when they invaded uh, Egypt? How did that war begin? It began with it's very well known a provocation by Israel in February 1955, a commando raid uh, uh, into Israel. How did the um, how did the 1982 Lebanon war begin? It began with Israeli provocations in June 1982 because it wanted a war in Lebanon. How did Operation Protective uh, uh, Cast Lead begin? It began, there was a ceasefire, just like there was a ceasefire uh, in uh, Lebanon in 1982. There's a ceasefire. The ceasefire in, before Cast Lead began in uh, June uh, 2008. And then Israel, it's established fact, Israel provoked the war with um, Gaza uh, by launching a commando raid uh, uh, in June. Uh, in the, I can't remember, it was November, I think. Yeah, November 4th, it was when mm. Barack was elected president. Uh, November 4th, 2008. So when Israel, if Israel is steadfast in its goals of inflicting a military, a permanent military defeat on uh, Hamas, it'll just provoke, it'll just have some provocation and break the ceasefire. So I, I can't even understand what's the point of talking about a long-term ceasefire, ceasefire, when you know that Israel's modus operandi is always there's a ceasefire, and then when it's ready to attack, it provokes a reaction, and then it goes in. So anyone who knows the history, this whole thing is just empty talk. If you were to ask me to speculate why Biden did it, that's another question but why he put forth this peace plan but it's it's realistic possibilities are zero and speaking about the history of israel and negotiations and and also this idea of deterrence um that they are you know especially within the idf are trying to reinforce um in gaza today um there is a a, a quote from the 70s um I, I i've struggled to find an actual you know legitimate source for it but but it's attributed to moshe dayan the the former um foreign minister and uh and you know g wartime general um uh, of israel who who was was asked about the um, expanding settlements and the situation in the West Bank and Gaza, and he responded, you know, um, that the question is not what is a solution, but how do we live without a solution? And uh, especially, you know, around that time, after the 1967 war, Israel gained a lot of its neighbor's territory, and there was a conventional wisdom at the time that Israel could use this to really negotiate a lasting peace with its Arab neighbors, but that it chose not to. It chose to try and hold on to this land and hold on to its perceived position of strength as a the best case scenario to protect itself and and to preserve its borders and it seems that this this alternate wisdom is the one that has continued to press israel forward and into every negotiation that it chooses to try and um maintain the upper hand whether militarily or or you know for, from a, a point of land um as opposed to trying an alternative way. And, and so my question to you is, is that do you think there was an alternative way for Israel, um, either today or in the past, to create a kind of permanent solution for itself that doesn't require it to continuously have these, these exercises of deterrence? Obviously, that enters into speculative territory. So I'll give, in my opinion, there are two parts to the answer to that question. There is no question whatsoever that there were possibilities for a negotiated settlement of the conflict between Israel and the leaderships of its Arab neighbors. The, um, by the early 1970s, the Arab states, with the partial exception of Syria, partial exception of Syria, um, the Arab states were willing to reach a settlement with Israel 
on the basis of UN Resolution 242, uh, which has been the abbreviation of that resolution, is the Land for Peace formula. You return the lands uh, illegally occupied uh, by you in the course of the June 1967 border. We recognize you as a state in the region in accordance with the terms of the United Nations Charter. So there's no question if you look at the factual record that the Arab states in general, and beginning in the mid 1970s, uh, the Palestinians in particular, were uh, amenable to a settlement along uh, international law, uh, the terms set by international law. But there's a second question, which I think we have to honestly address, not that it's absolutely critical in the short term, but it's critical in the medium term. The second question is, would the Arab world accept a Jewish state which discriminated against its non-Jewish population in perpetuity. Now you will recall that the continent of Africa was unwilling in the long run to accept a white supremacist state on its continent. They did accept a state which was recept which was grounded in one person, one vote, whites get equal rights, which was the uh the critical demand of the African National Congress, one person, one vote, the continent was not demanding that the whites have to return to Europe, even though the Pan-African Congress, which is the main rival of the ANC in South Africa, it did for a very long time demand that all the whites have to go back to Europe. Mm -hmm. Africa was for the Africans. That wasn't the position of the ANC, which eventually became the dominant political party or faction in South Africa, and the continent accepted it. Now, would the Arab world in perpetuity, not in the short term, accept a Jewish supremacist state in its midst? And that goes along with a second question. Would Israel in the long term accept a position of equality with the other Arab states? Not necessarily economic equality. Obviously, Israel is a very sophisticated, high-tech country, and it's no under no obligation to reduce its or diminish its economic superiority. But the question is, would Israel accept being, there's an expression in, La, uh, in Latin, uh, primus inter pares. It means first among equals. Mm -hmm. Will they accept to be primus inter pares, the first among equals, or was it determined to maintain its domination of the Arab world? I would say Israel would re require a real internal reckoning for it to accept being anything less than the hegemonic power in the Middle East. I don't believe they would accept anything less than being the hegemonic power, and I don't believe they would accept anything less than a Jewish supremacist state. And that means the prospects, even though there were 
Political prospects, no question. The record, in my opinion, is crystal clear. I've written extensively on it. Yes, there was a possibility for a settlement, uh, but I'm not sure how long it would have lasted. The main problem now with Iran is not that Iran is threatening Israel. It was that Israel refuses to have a regional power that is um, its equal. It won't accept that Iran would be a co-hegemonic power with Israel in the Middle East. The whole of the Middle East has to be subordinated to Israeli power. Uh, so with that mindset and with the long history behind it, uh, I guess in the longer term, I would be dubious that even had there been a political settlement, it would have been stable. Speaking of the comparison that you made with uh, South Africa and, and apartheid South Africa, one thing that I heard you uh, speak about, um, I think back in October actually, is that the primary difference in your eyes between apartheid South Africa and Israel is that South Africa and apartheid South Africa never made a moral argument for itself, for its own existence, whereas the existence of Israel and uh, and the existence of you know an Israel that is exclusively um, created for the sovereignty of Jewish people rests on that moral argument. And and I wonder from your opinion, is that is that question of, of a moral argument, a moral right to exist for a state that is built around um, the sovereignty of Jewish people, is that argument still as strong as it once was? And, and are the actions of Israel over the last eight months and over the last couple of decades undermining that argument to its own detriment? Well, that's an, answer. that's an excellent question. We may be now at a tipping point that up until October 7th, I'm talking about the mainstream public, mainstream public political arena. The question of Israel went back as far as 1967, which is to say, the legitimacy of Israel was accepted by the international community as a Jewish state. However, the issue in contention was the status and future of the occupied Palestinian territories. Since October 7th, I would say, given the death and destruction of an, on an astronomical scale of the death and destruction that Israel has wreaked on, on Gaza, and the fact that now it has pinned to its lapel the scarlet letter of genocide, the G for genocide, the whole legitimacy of the state of Israel as a Jewish state has been called into question. Up until 19, no, from 1967 afterwards, Israel as a Jewish state was accepted. The question was the status of the occupied Palestinian territories. Since October 7th, the legitimacy of the state itself has been called into question. So now we're back in 1948, whether Israel as a state has a legitimate right to exist. And you can see that in many manifestations that there's now a tension. Are we talking about 67 or are we talking about 48? Are we talking about the occupied Palestinian territories or are we talking about that whole parcel of land from the river to the sea? And you see that very, um, you see that very vividly in the South African position. If you read the South African 
documents, not the documents, if you look at the oral proceedings of South Africa uh, at the ICJ, there have been two sets of oral proceedings. The first person who speaks, I can't remember his name now. I have it right here. So you know, since I have my the papers here, I might as well just uh, get his name correctly. Mr. Mad on Sela, M A D O N S C L A. When he begins each of the two oral proceedings, he goes back to 48. He says, This has been a racist, illegal state from the get go. When I first heard him say that, because the proceedings began in January, mid-January, January 17th. I said, no, don't go there. You're going to undermine the case. Let's just stick to Gaza. Let's not throw Israel into question, because you're going to lose half the judges on the court. But he questioned the entire legitimacy of what some people call the Zionist project or the state of Israel. However, the South Africans always state in all of their public declarations that they support the two-state settlement. So my point is you could see there's a tension there. Mm. Are we talking about 1948, namely the whole legitimacy of the state of Israel has been called into question, or are we talking about 1967, Israel as is, where is the Palestinian state next to Israel? So I would say you are correct that beginning October 7th, the legitimacy, I should say, and its aftermath, October 7, the genocidal war in Gaza, the entire legitimacy of the state of Israel has now been called into question by the international community. And it's likely, I would say, that question mark is likely to endure Israel as a state, not just as an occupying power, as a state, its legitimacy has suffered an irreparable blow, in my opinion, that scarlet letter G for genocide has now been affixed to it. I would have to say, um, I want you said, in my opinion, the crucial difference between South Africa and Israel is so, uh, South Africa never attempted an intellectual, a sustained public intellectual justification for South Africa for a simple reason. It was a completely lost cause because it was the middle of the civil rights movement in the United States. Mm. And a Jim Crow system in South Africa, where our whole society was in the process of repudiating it in the American South. It was a Sisyphean labor to try to make a public intellectual defense for South African apartheid in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Israel obviously has invested a huge amount of resources, public and private, uh, behind the scenes, behind closed doors, and publicly to trying to defend its legitimacy and also trying to repress in brutal mafia-like ways any dissent from the so-called, I hate the word, but I'll use it now, the Israeli narrative uh, of uh, speaking to its legitimacy. <clears throat> 
But there is another difference where many people, oh, I don't call myself pro-Palestinian, I call myself pro-truth and pro-justice. Um, many people on the so-called pro-Palestinian side, I don't believe they're giving a hard look at the situation. What do I mean by that? In South Africa, as I said earlier, the African National Congress was ideologically committed to one person, one vote. They were not committed to an ethnically black state. Now, you might say that's just a play on words. Since black people were the majority, overwhelming majority in South Africa, mm -hmm. one person, one vote is going to mean a black state for you know, sheer demographic reasons. That is, and it isn't true. I would say there was a deep-seated ideological commitment uh, by the South Africans beyond simply becoming a black state through the back door of being the demographic majority. So I'll give you an example. Well, first of all, there were many whites in the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. They were welcomed, they were active, uh, and they played a very, you know, they played a very critical role. Uh, but secondly, as an ideological matter, the second person, the second ranking person in the ANC was a fellow named Walter Sisulu. And Walter Sisulu was once asked, do you expect to live to see a black president of South Africa? And his reply was, I'm not interested in the black president of South Africa. I'm interested in a democratically elected president of South Africa. One person, one vote. And I do believe that was a sincere commitment. I can't prove it. Maybe it was Machiavellian that he knew if we got the vote, we we're gonna have our black president. I don't believe it was Machiavellian because I understand the mentality of that tradition. I feel part of that tradition. It's the tradition of the, uh, of the socialist communist era, um, this commitment to an all embracing humanity mm -hmm. now embodied in the South African rainbow flag. Uh, namely, we are a multicultural society. We represent everybody. I think I was sincere. Uh, I'm not faulting. I'm not nitpicking. There has never been that kind of commitment among the Palestinian solidarity, Palestinian movement inside Palestine. It was always an Arab nationalist movement. Yeah, there were some elements, you know, people are going to say Dr. George Habash in the PFLP, but I would say pretty marginal. Overwhelmingly, it was a Arab nationalist movement. And with an and is the uh, Islamic movements, the um, Hamas and other Islamic movements, they are what you might call a extreme version of this Arab Muslim nationalism. It's not Arab nationalism, it's Muslim, you know, but it's also Arab nationalism. Uh, um, I can't see a coexistence with Israel. I mean, the talk of one state just doesn't make any sense to me because you can't have one state if at least on one side, you don't have a deep commitment to a democratic state. You know, you take the case of our own American South. One of the reasons, uh, our own in the United States, one of the reasons the civil rights movement could happen is because for various reasons, blacks in, American, in the American South, they were not vindictive. They really weren't. They were genuinely committed to peaceful coexistence on, a, on 
uh, on political uh, equality. Give us the vote, and then we can live together. You know, obviously, it also meant improving the life, uh, the the, the um, material life, but at a political level, it was give us the vote, one person, one vote, and desegregate the facilities because the facilities were unequal. Uh, there's, I don't believe there's such an ideological co commitment on either side. The Jews are absolutely committed to a Jewish supremacist state. And I don't believe there's a, I don't want to call it a democratic culture. I would call it a democratic mindset. Namely, the mindset is, uh, this land belongs to us. And I don't see, I don't see as a practical matter, if you talk about one state now, okay, can you imagine a coalition government or a federated government between Mr. Sinwar and Mr. Netanyahu or Mr. Sinwar? <laughs> I thought that would be an extreme scenario. <laughs> Well, but when you think it through, isn't that what it comes down to? But do you think that's a consequence of there not being space for this conversation that the voices that may exist and that are uh, that that need the kind of uh, environment to flourish um, aren't given an opportunity to be able to do that? Because I mean, you know, you, you mentioned voices on the Palestinian side. There are also um, many voices on the Israeli side that, that do advocate for that. They are definitely in the minority and they're not taken seriously, but they exist. I would say you need a reality check if you think many voices on the Israeli side. The most recent polls show that among Jewish Israelis, exactly 4% believe Israel is using too much force in Gaza, and about 40% believe Israel is using too little force in Gaza. So to disentangle that from that, many Israelis want coexistence within one state. Actually, I think you could probably fit in, into my apartment, and I have a very small apartment. The number of Israelis, <laughs> Jewish, no, I'm serious, Jewish Israelis who are committed to one state. That's just not factually correct. Then let's talk about uh, international law and, and the ICC. And, and you mentioned South Africa's case of the ICJ. And uh, I mean, to, to, to put it facetiously, um, there's many in the global south that have always been very skeptical of international law, the, the instruments of international law and their application. Um, and, you know, what has been happening over the last couple of months has been championed by a lot of people. And they've seen the uh, the recent movements uh, by the prosecution and the ICC. And then, of course, uh, South Africa's case at the ICJ, as well as a lot of um, the positions that have come out of the United Nations as positive uh, movements towards holding Israel's government to account. On the other side of that, you've seen the reaction from Israel as well as the United States, um, which have, you know, uh, uh, rejected uh, at best, uh, attacked at worst and tried to undermine the authority of these bodies. And, uh, you know, with keeping into account the idea that whether or not international law is really an instrument that represents everybody. But at this particular moment, with the amount of publicity um, on these cases, on the, the situation on the ground in Gaza, what, is, what are the stakes, in your opinion, for international law, for our ability as a world to be able to function under some sort of framework that sets out the rules of engagement, the rules to protect people. What happens if we move forward and there isn't any accountability at all for what has happened over the last eight months? First of all, we have to be careful about not conflating the ICC and the ICJ. For the sake of your viewers, your listeners, let's just start out with a basic distinction. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is the judicial arm of the United Nations. And it's concerned, considered to be the uh, supreme legal body in the world. Sometimes it's called the World Court as a shorthand. 
The ICC, on the other side, uh, is a relatively new body, the International Criminal Court. And I think one can fairly say it's been hopelessly corrupt uh, since its inception. Its first chief prosecutor was a fellow named Luis Moreno Ocampo, who was personally very corrupt and ran a tight ship in support of the Western powers. It was at that point during his stewardship of the ICC, he was the chief prosecutor, which is the highest uh, office in the ICC. The ICC came to be called uh, by skeptics, not the International Criminal Court, but the International Caucasian Court, because it only prosecuted African leaders. That's or despots, however you want to put it. That was its full range, just African leaders. It became kind of an embarrassment <clears throat> for the court. So they chose as the successor to Luis Moreno Ocampo, they chose Fatou Bensouda from, um, she was from the Gambia. And she also had a very sordid record already in the Gambia for being a crooked judge. And so she was a very useful mascot for the real powers that be in the ICC because she was black and she was a woman. So she was very woke <clears throat> by the current standards, but she could be relied upon to do the bidding of the hidden masters, the puppeteers. Uh, and for which she was just, as I said, um, a mascot, as Dr. Cornell West called Barack Obama. He was a mascot, a black mascot for Wall Street. Uh, that was the same thing with Fatou Bensouda. And Fatou Bensouda's record, uh, contrary to some things that are now being said, her, her record on Israel-Palestine was absolutely horrendous. It was total, she was a complete and total crook. I mean, it was so appalling. Uh, I can't go through now that record because it would take us too far afield. But the first case that came before her having to do with Israel-Palestine was the case of the Mavi Marmara. The Mavi Marmara was the flagship of a flotilla that was trying to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza in 2010. And it came under attack by an Israeli commando unit on May 30th, 2010. They killed 10 passengers, murdered them really, uh, 10 passengers. And for reasons not worth going into, it eventually came to the ICC. Now, from the get-go, Fatou Bin Suda did everything possible to halt the case, to kill the case. What she was doing was so outrageous, so scandalous, that forces within the ICC, honorable forces, kept the case alive. So she declared it closed. It then was appealed. The appeal was upheld. It went back to her. She had to do another investigation. She did, killed again. Again, totally outrageous. And so the forces within the ICC would not let go. It was appealed again. The appeal was upheld. It went before her a third time. And by the third time, uh, I had already uh, stopped chronicling it. I was so enraged by what was going on, because I was following it deep, but detail by detail, that I devoted a full book, which I'm holding up now. I never hold up my books. <laughs> But the book was so preposterous, I admit it myself. I admit it. I'm not telling anyone to read the book. It was this microscopic examination of the court record 
And the title is I Accuse. And the subtitle is a very long subtitle. Here with a proof beyond reasonable doubt that ICC Chief Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda whitewashed Israel. Now, of course, nobody wanted to read a book. Who the hell is Fatou Bensouda? What's he writing a whole book about her? And in truth, there was some grounds for it. I wrote it because I was hoping in future proceedings in the ICC, the record would be preserved of what Fatou Bensouda had done. Now, at the same time as that case was still pending because of the third appeal, there was a second case and it was brought before the ICC by this entity called the State of Palestine. Mm -hmm. The first case was not brought by Palestinians. It was brought by the owner the, of the, the, uh, the Mavi Mamra, which was the Union of the Comoros. Uh, but the second case was brought by what was called the State of Palestine. Now, the ICC is a state-based entity, which is to say, let's say Israel murdered your mother, not beyond the possibility of Israel. You can't go to the ICC. Only states can register complaints with the ICC. So the issue became, did Israel qualify as a state. Now, Fatou Ben Suda had this huge cloud over her head because of her scandalous conduct in the Mavi Marmara. On the other hand, no, so she wanted to clear her name a little before she left office. On the other hand, I believe she was either being blackmailed or bribed by Israel. So how do you clear your name while you're being blackmailed or bribed? What she did was pretty clever, I would say. She submitted a document, very well argued, I don't believe she wrote it. She submitted a document saying Israel was a state by the standards of the ICC. So here she's, did I say Israel? Yeah, Palestine. Palestine. Palestine was a state by the standards of the ICC, okay? So right now she's defying Israel, it seems. But then what does she do? She says, well, that's my opinion, but I might be wrong. So I'm going to let what's called the pre-trial chamber of the ICC, I'm going to let them decide whether I'm right or not. To make a long story short, it dragged on and on and on and on until finally in February 2021, the pre-trial chamber decides Fatou Ben Suda was correct, and the case can go on. Well, guess what? Three months later, her term of office her term of office was over. <laughs> and you want to hear the funniest part? Ken Roth is the former executive director of Human Rights Watch. He left Human Rights Watch a few months, uh, probably a year ago, I guess, maybe more. Maybe it's more than a year already. He writes his op-ed in the Guardian newspaper, acclaiming Fatou Ben Souda for having the courage to defy uh, Israel, even though as it came out, Israel was attempting to blackmail mm. Fatou Ben Souda. Which, for anyone who knows the actual record, defy Israel? Her full term of office 
was invested in scandalously defending Israel against very plausible allegations as to how its commandos conducted themselves on the Mavi Marmara on the morning of May 30th at 4 a.m. when it launched its commando raid. And then at the very end, when she had this whole cloud hovering over her because of how she conducted herself, she does write a document that does defy Israel, but then lets the process drag out and drag out until finally, just as her document is upheld by the pretrial chamber, she leaves office. I, I just, you know, Ken Roth is a very smart guy. I can't say his record as head of the IHRW, a Har, a Human Rights Watch, was terrific. No, it was very far from terrific. It wasn't terrible. I, you know, facts are facts. It wasn't terrific, but it wasn't terrible. Okay. But for him, he's now left off, and he's been very good since he left the HRW. He has said he believes Israel is engaged in a genocide in Gaza. He's put himself squarely on the line there. But to, to acclaim Ben Suda, she was obviously being either blackmailed or bribed uh, by Israel. If you look at the record, it was so shameful. Actually, at the very end, I didn't want to make the charge against Ben Suda publicly because it would have distracted from what I assembled in the book. I go through the whole court record line by line. And if I made a charge which I believe but I can't prove, we're entering into the murky waters of, of uh, a charge of blackmail or uh, bribery, and I couldn't prove it. But the very last sentence of the book, uh, I write that Israel will bring to bear every squalid and sordid instrument in its arsenal to stop the ICC. Every squalid and because I knew it was blackmail or bribery, but I decided not to go there because it would become a distraction from the record I assembled in the book. And now, of course, there's there's new reporting that's just come out uh, in the last couple of days that, that that kind of reinforces that notion that, you know, there's a there was an investigation by The Guardian 972 magazine that suggests exactly what you're implying is that there was diplomatic and not so diplomatic pressure um, by Israeli intelligence on, on, on Ben Suda. But they don't. Uh, that's correct. Uh, but they don't go into the pre uh, that second application to the court regarding uh, what or the, the the application to the court by the state of Palestine basically referred to the question of the settlements and the blockade of Gaza that Israel was committing war crimes under the Rome statute by building the settlements and by having erected this blockade of Gaza. It doesn't go into the Mavi Marmara uh, litigation, probably because almost nobody knows about it, you know. In any event, so that's the ICC. Now the ICJ, well, its record hasn't been bad. I mean, people completely forgot or don't know because you're too young. You know, time flies and you wouldn't even know these things. Uh, in July 2004, the ICJ delivered a what was called advisory opinion on the status of the wall that Israel was building in the West Bank at the time. And it was a, a, an opinion that completely vindicated the Palestinians, completely. It was a total victory for the Palestinians. And the vote was 14 to 1. The only one to vote against was the American judge, A. Thomas Bergenthal, 
But already in 2004, July 2004, the Palestinians uh, garnered a stunning victory at the International Court of Justice. As to the situation now, well, as you know, the first vote was um, 15 to 2. Uh, the vote that was on January 26, 2000. Yes, January 26, 2004. The vote was 15 to 2. Uh, and the most recent vote, uh, there are two judges who weren't part uh, of the proceedings for reasons not worth going into. The vote was 13 to 2. So again, it's been a huge victory. Uh, the ICC is obviously, it's highly politicized, but it's still, I would say, a more honest, I would say, with three qualifications. First qualification is the first uh, uh, vote on January 26th. At that time, the president of the court was Joan Donahue, who was from the United States. You might recall her as the person who read the ICJ order to the court. Uh, she uh, and it was a, a memorable moment that even the American judge was going along with the order of the court on January 26th. And the, under, the universal understanding of what she said on January 26th was that the ICJ had found that Israel was plausibly committing genocide in Gaza. Everybody interpreted that way, including Israel, which began to denounce the court as being anti-Semitic and so forth. What does she do? Well, Joan Donahue stepped down from the court, her term had ended, and she needed a job. So what did she do? She went on the BBC program Hard Talk on April 26th, if my memory serves. April 26, 2024, just a couple of months ago. And she stated that the court has been widely misunderstood we never said that Israel was plausibly committing genocide. Now, I will say to your listeners, to your viewers, in no uncertain terms, that is a flat out, shameless, and shameful lie. I've spent the past three weeks in one of those tedious, mind-numbing exercising exercises of going through that whole court record to demonstrate what she said was, I repeat, a flagrant, shameless, shameful lie. Now, I am perfectly willing to come on your program or any other program to debate her on the question. I will finish today the first draft of the article because my mind has just slowed down in the course of the past seven months and the kinds of tedious labor which have done the whole of my adult life now is ever more excruciating, both because of my sheer physical age, but also because of being overwhelmed by the events since October 7th. However, I am very confident that I can prove 
as I did with uh, Fatu Ben Suda, prove beyond reasonable doubt, <laughs> just like Fatu Ben Suda, Joan Donahue is attempting, not because of my belief, not because of blackmail and bribery, no, I don't believe that, but sheer careerism and opportunism, she's whitewashing Israel. That is a direct challenge to her, and I would be perfectly, uh, I believe I would be able perfectly able to sustain that claim should she choose to come on the airwaves or in this case the web with me there is also in my opinion a giant question mark hovering over julia sabutindi the current ugandan representative in the icj who was recently elevated to the status of the vice president. I would say there is, as lawyers like to say, prima facie evidence, uh, what you might say, at first glance evidence that she too is being either bribed or blackmailed by Israel. I do believe I can sustain those charges because otherwise her dissents, as you might know, in the first ICJ order of March 26th, there was an Israeli on the court. His name is Aharon uh, Barak. He just stepped down yesterday. He wrote a separate opinion for the ICJ uh, order. The only one to write a dissent, the only one, was Julia Sabutindi. In the second instance, by the, there was a one in February, and uh, February one was, um, I don't remember how, no, she didn't vote. But there was in March, March 28th, there was another order by the court. And this time, Sebatindi quietly went along with the court. And my opinion is because after what she did in January, Everyone was so outraged, not least in Africa, that even the head of state of Uganda disowned it. They publicly said they disowned what she did. So she realized she was in trouble. And so when it came to the March order, she stayed mum. But then, as we know the expression, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. So when it came to the last order, that was the one you remember that Israel has to hold its military activities in Rafa. Yeah. That was the order on May 24th. Guess what? I have it in front of me because I'm right now going through it. She issues another dissent. And this dissent, it even has, if you read the other dissents, they're usually two or three pages, something like that or I should say declarations or separate opinions, they're usually two or three pages, kind of, oh no, they are precise, but they're also not like formal, they're not so formal legal documents. She even has on this a table of contents of her dissent, a table of contents. You never see that in separate opinions, and you just don't. And so I think, her puppeteers told her, we gave you a pass on March 28th because we know you had a cloud hanging over you after what you did in January, where 
everybody in Uganda was repudiating you. But now you have to get back and do your job. And she proceeds to write, I could show you from internal evidence that what she's writing is completely and totally insane. Really, insane, bonkers. So you have to ask why. Why is she going out on the limb? Why is a judge from Uganda going out on the limb for Israel? Why is that happening? I think there's an, <laughs> a very mundane explanation. Now, I could see I've gone on for eternity, and it's already 1230, and I have to get back to work because I have to go through Ju Judge Sabatindi for the fourth, fifth time. I have no idea how many times I've read it at this point. And I appreciate that that you that you have a, an article um, that you need to publish, and and I look forward to, to reading it. I, I guess just to wrap things up, my final question, um, and just on the on this last thought with regards to the, these challenges that have been brought before Israel and in front of international courts and in front of the ICJ and the ICC and in front of the court of public opinion, um, there is so much attention on this. There is so much that feels like it's at stake for international law or some semblance of it to be defended publicly and to be upheld. Do you think this is a turning point, uh, a real almost existential challenge to the way that the world trusts and sees value in these systems, in, in a kind of a unified, agreed upon um, document of, of law? Look, I will, and it's a good question to end the program. You can never trust these instruments of power. As the famous abolitionist, the American abolitionist, uh, Frederick Douglass, who was a slave and then became active in the movement to abolish slavery. He once said, power never concedes anything without a demand. It never has and never will. Period, full stop. Power never concedes anything without a demand. It never has and it never will. You can't trust any institutions of power. You just can't. What has happened is there has been a confluence of forces which have now reached critical mass. There was the Hezbollah in the north. There were the Houthis. There was the ICJ. There was the magnificent application submitted by the South Africans. There was the tenacity of the South Africans. They started December 29th. There was a ruling January 26th. They went back to the court in February. They went back to the court in March. They went back to the court in May. They wouldn't relent. And then there were the student demonstrations. It starts on one campus and then it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. And before you know it, it spread to Europe. And those demonstrations put the Palestine question at a place in the public agenda, excuse me, uh, the public uh, eye, which in the United States could no longer be ignored. Not that before it had been ignored. No, obviously it was in the headlines. But the student demonstrations added an element of momentum and and moral impressiveness. You know, college nowadays is not like in my day. It's very expensive. Uh, Columbia is $80,000 a year. And getting in is not easy. Mm. Highly, highly, highly competitive, more so than my generation. And these students were risking suspension, expulsion. Uh, and when you're in one of those schools, you're working very hard to get into a good professional school, getting into a good law school, getting into a medical school. And one bad grade can bring down what's called in the United States, your GPA, your grade point average. It's not easy 
to be in an encampment for a month or so and still do your papers and still do your studying and still preparing for finals. Mm -hmm. It was very, you have to say, it was very impressive. And to defy the administrations, not easy, not easy. So all of those elements, those unpredictable elements, who would have ever thought the Houthis would become a power in world politics, you know? Who would have ever thought the IC, the South Africans would go to bat for a poor, powerless, stateless people in Gaza, in this godforsaken place, this godforsaken concentration camp called Gaza, and not just go to bat for them, but the level of professionalism, if you read their application, if you read each time before they went before the court again and again and again, each submission is replete with footnotes and references. This is not just a blank piece of paper on which they scribbled a few words. No, this required a team of researchers of a very high caliber. So anyone looking for a silver bullet that's going to you know, solve it, no. That's not how politics works. It's a confluence of forces which gradually reach at some point, to use the cliche, critical mass. Mm -hmm. And then they have some impact. Is it yet the impact one would like? No. But is it no impact? No. No, it's a, it's a, who would have thought that we would be debating whether or not Israel is a genocidal state? You know, <laughs> that was an unthinkable thought a year ago. Who would be debating? Now, there has been a claim that's plausibly genocidal. Other people say it's not plausibly genocidal. But the important point is that's become now a term of debate, whether or not it's a genocidal state. That puts Israel in a very, very ugly category, that we're even debating that issue. And we're debating it with credibility, where mainstream figures like Kenneth Roth, Ken Roth, Arya Nair in the New York Review of Books are saying it is a genocide. It's carrying on a genocide. So there's been a dramatic shift in public opinion, as I already indicated, a, a shift of such magnitude that the entire legitimacy of the state of Israel has now been called into question, not just the occupation not just the legitimacy of the occupation, but the legitimacy of the state itself. So it has been a very it's significant moment. And I don't think there's, I think one should, we don't trust these institutions. On the other hand, I think you can make the institutions work for us, but only if, as Frederick Douglass says, you make a demand, which is to say, you have to put your lives and your bodies on the line to force this, to force the necessary change. A very poignant way to, to end, and I really appreciate your time, Professor Norman Finkelstein. So much more I'd love to speak to you about, so I hope you will join us again soon. And, and best of luck for your work, for your publication today, and I look forward to reading it. I don't think you will want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I'll, be honest. I'll take you up on that challenge. <laughs> it's, it's my first draft, and I dread having to reread it for the second draft. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this episode of The Big Picture and a big thank you to our guest today, Norman Finkelstein. We want to hear what you have to say about this conversation and about the ongoing war in Gaza. So please leave your thoughts in the comments below. 
and let us know who you'd like us to speak to next. As always, you can hear all of our episodes in audio format wherever you get your podcasts from. And until next time, salam.